A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, uh, Lecture 250, uh, number 37 in our series from Squint and Pediatric Ophthalmology. And today, again, is an exam special by Dr. Nina R. Ma'am from Giridhar Eye Institute, Kochi. And she'll be dealing with the short cases in strabismus. I think very important for all our postgraduate uh, exam going uh, PGs. Uh, so ma'am is, uh, she has done her MBBS from Government Medical College Trivandrum and her MS and DO from Regional Institute of Ophthalmology Trivandrum. She went on to do a uh, Saratan Tata Fellowship in Advanced Cataract Surgery and Community Ophthalmology and Fellowship in Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus from uh, the renowned Shankaran Netralaya Chennai. Currently, ma'am is the senior consultant and head department of Pediatric Ophthalmology, Strabismus and Neuro-Ophthalmology in Giridhar Eye Institute, Kochi. Uh, she has special interest in neuroophthalmology, uh, pediatric cortical visual impairment, myopia control, complex strabismus, acquired competent esotropias. She has over 20 years of teaching and clinical experience, and she has numerous publications in both national and international journals. And herself, she is a winner of many awards at the national and international conferences. A very, very warm welcome, ma'am, and uh, over to you for all our postgraduate exam, uh, exam going PGs. Thank you, Dr. Shefali. Uh, so I'm indeed very honored to be uh, present here on this iFocus online platform. And let me thank at the outset, Dr. Santosh Fonavar and the entire iFocus team for putting up such a great academic exercises, which is going to be of tremendous use to the postgraduates and to the fellows also. So today I've been asked to talk on uh, short cases in strabismus, and uh, it's going to be an exam-oriented uh, approach an overview and uh, went through the previous modules and a lot of uh, experts have you know spoken on the various topics specifically and uh, all the postgraduates uh, they've watched they must be thorough with all the different types of uh, cases so this is just going to be an exam oriented overview so i would like to share my screen now Sorry, I think there's some program. So I think this we shared. I'll just go back. This was just opened up previously, isn't it? Yeah. So my screen is visible and I'm audible. Yeah, ma'am, perfectly. Yeah. So, so as I understand, uh, the practical examination is a little different for MS ophthalmology and DNB candidates. Uh, the MS ophthalmology candidates would be having one long case and two short cases. And uh, the DNP candidates, as I understand, as of now have two long cases and OSCE from the you know, recent uh, change, what has happened now. But nevertheless, these are the common short cases which would be of interest to both the groups. So these can be kept as a long or short case, depending on the availability of cases. And you're expected to know uh, the common features, uh, the tests to diagnose it and uh, management of these. So I'll be uh, discussing a few of this, most of this, and depending on the time permitted, uh, let's see how many cases we can have today. So uh, are there any postgraduates uh, joined uh, in the session right now? Ma'am, as of now, nobody has joined. If they are there, probably towards the end, I can yeah. make it interactive with you. So the case one would be that of a seven-month-old baby girl who has been brought by her parents with complaints of squinting since three months of age. As you can see, I managed to click a nine gaze picture, though not very perfect. It gives you an idea about her ocular alignment and ocular motility. So her, she has a perfectly normal birth history with normal developmental milestones and her cyclorefraction is as uh, written there. So if you can have a look, good look at her nine gazes, uh, what you see is a right convergence squint and fairly uh, okay uh, abduction in the right eye. So no particular pattern and uh, she's squinting since three months of age. That's what her parents say. And they're very concerned about it because it is, uh, you know, bothering them. So, so this would be one case scenario which would be presented to the postgraduate. So how do you go about it? So first thing uh, is, you know, take a proper history uh, in these cases to know whether it has been present since birth. So since she's only, uh, you know, seven months old and present since uh, three months, it is definitely something, you know, uh, infantile onset or uh, congenital onset. Okay, so before uh, we go on to the examination proper, make sure that it is not a pseudostrobismus. So rule out pseudoisotropia. So as you can see in the picture, if you pinch the epicanthic folds, sometimes the symmetry becomes more obvious. 
and the asymmetry disappears. So signs of pseudoisotropia would be, this is very confusing even uh, now, even now, uh, sometimes the cases are very confusing for consultants also. So if you see less sclera nasally due to either an epicanthic fold, uh, you know, or a broad nasal bridge or a negative angle kappa and, uh, or, uh, you know, a narrow IPD, this could be a pseudoisotropia. So how do you make out it? So one thing is that the corneal reflex test would be centered normally. There is no abnormal Hirschberg test. And when you, if you're able to do a cover test, uh, they wouldn't give you any movement of the eyes. So rule out a pseudoisotropia, but a word of caution, sometimes you can have a true isotropia coexisting with the pseudostrobismus. So keep these children under regular follow-up. So coming to our patient, uh, again, what else to see for? So take a proper birth history. Now coming to the clinical evaluation. So what are you going to be asked in this? So what are you going to look for? So basically, you have to see whether the child has any fixation preference for any eye. Is there any significant amblyopia? Now, how do you see that? See if the squint is alternating. Child is taking up fixation in either eye freely. Look at the ocular movements. You can look at the central steady maintained fixation in both the eyes to see if the fixation is equally good in both eyes. And if possible, measure the deviation and look for any patterns alphabet patterns like AOV patterns, and definitely follow it up with a cycloplegic refraction and a dilated fundus, because sometimes a sensory isotropia can also present to you like this. So at this point, you really don't know, but your primary diagnosis, uh, because of the you know, early onset and uh, normal uh, birth history and normal developmental history and a constant angle of strabismus could be an infantile isotropia. So I'd just like to show a small video uh, to show you what I mean by central steady maintained fixation and alternating conversion screen. So this boy, if you can see, he's readily switching his fixation from right to left and the squint is alternating. No resistance to occlusion of either eye. This means the squint is alternating and he does not have any significant amblyopia in any eye. So presence of cross fixation and uh, alternating fixation indicates absence of any significant amblyopia. But if you have a strong preference for one eye, he resists occlusion of the good eye, then definitely there is amblyopia in the squinting eye. So next thing would be to look for ocular movement. So many often the postgraduates ask us, you know, how do we really know there is no lateral rectus palsy? Sometimes the abduction seems to be limited. How do we know? So what you can do is that you can try monocular occlusion. As in this picture, you can see this child appears to have a significant abduction limitation on versions. But when you do the ductions and close the eye, other eye, you can see the abduction is fairly good. So this is one way. Or you can try the doll's eye maneuver or spin the child rapidly and to, to elicit a vestibular stimulation and you may get a good uh, full abduction. Another thing uh, would be, you know, uh, to check for intact abduction saccades. So sometimes when you have a uh, long-standing esotropia, you have a very tight medial rectus and uh, even despite your monocular occlusion or, uh, you know, doll's eye maneuver, you may still find the abduction is not full. So if you're able to elicit good abduction, saccadic eye movements, even with a mild limitation of abduction, indicates that there is no real lateral rectus palsy and there is good lateral rectus function and it's just due to a tight medial rectus uh, that you're having this mild limitation of abduction. So also look at whether there is any particular pattern, B pattern, A pattern, or any inferior oblique overaction. So V pattern with inferior oblique overaction is quite common in infantile isotropia. So next is to measure the deviation. So in a short case, you may not be expected to really measure, but you can at least do the Hirschberg test, see where the corneal reflex is. If possible, get a prism bar cover test, or at least a modified Krimsky or Krimsky test. So I'll always mention that you would do a cycloplegic refraction because you do want to rule out an accommodative element in this, even though the child is too small for accommodative isotropia, sometimes you can get an accommodative component. So if you get anything more than 2.5 to 3, please do give a full cycloplegic correction and see how the isotropia behaves. If the isotropia is well controlled, you can wait for a while. But if there is a significant isotropia persisting despite the full uh, cycloplegic hypermetropic correction, then you may have to intervene for this child. 
So also don't forget to dilate and see because I've had patients being referred for surgery turning out to have a macular scar and uh, turning out to be a sensory esotropia. So it's very important you do a dilated good fundus examination along with the cyclopegic uh, refraction. So in this case, if such a case is to be presented, the discussion would uh, hinge upon how do you come to the diagnosis of essential infantile isotropia? So we basically look at the CMAS classification, that is the congenital eye movement abnormalities and strabismus classification, which gives you the criteria for essential infantile isotropia. Already I have mentioned, uh, you know, uh, infantile onset, fairly large angle, constant deviation in a neurologically healthy child, and the typical features of cross fixation and sometimes inferior oblique overaction. DVD and nystagmus may be there. The second would be, what would be the differential diagnosis in this case? So the differential diagnosis, common ones we would say would be a Duane's retraction syndrome or a congenital six nerve palsy because you have a doubt whether there is some abduction limitation in that eye. Then a variant of infantile 18 known as Cianchia syndrome also can present with a tight medial rectus and limitation of abduction that can also be put forward as a differential diagnosis. Congenital fibrosis syndrome, uh, of course, will have associated other features like ptosis and uh, limitation of other ocular movements also. And uh, rarely infantile myasthenia grabs can also present, but that would come way down in your diagnostic list. And sometimes you may have an nystagmus blockage syndrome in which the child has a nystagmus and tries to, uh, you know, use the convergence to dampen the uh, nystagmus and develops an esotropia. So these are the common differential diagnosis of infantile esotropia. Uh, first ones would be a congenital six nerve palsy. Uh, I would say Duane's first and then the congenital six nerve palsy and uh, the others in, uh, in, the, uh, in the other order. So the next question would be is how do you manage? So management we have just briefly discussed. Then if you're going to intervene, when would you do the surgery? So surgery is the treatment of infantile isotropia. And when would you do the surgery? Because parents are also going to be asking you about it. So there is a lot of controversy about it. Some people advocate very early surgery, that is before six months. Some people say six to 18 months early surgery. And some people say after 18 months. So generally, early surgery is what we recommend. Uh, Any time between six to 18 months uh, is a good time. but there are studies which show that if you operate early and if you're able to get consistently same uh, you know, measurements of the squint at least two to three visits and you're able to uh, demonstrate uh, you know, that the squint is remaining the same, an early surgery would definitely give, you the, give the child the benefit of binocular vision. So, so that depends from case to case. And what surgery to do? So these are some uh, questions which the examiner may pose to you. So... So the management of essential infantile isotropia is essentially surgical. So uh, you have to align the eyes. Uh, if it's alternating freely, bi bilateral medial rectus recession, especially in small children, is preferred. Uh, and uh, if the child is densely amblyopic, you may even do a process resect in the amblyopic eye and look for any V patterns or inferior oblique overactions with DVD. Mostly these uh, manifest a little later, but if it's present, you may have to tackle it with the primary surgery because otherwise the child will continue to squint and uh, will not have a chance at binocularity. And uh, also uh, it's very important to know the non-surgical aspects of it because if the child has any significant refractive error, please do correct it. And any amblyopia should be corrected. Uh, an attempt should be made to correct the amblyopia both in the pre-operative phase as well as the post-operative phase. And if you have any residual squints or consecutive squints, you must correct that also or take care of it. And uh, of late, uh, there are a lot of advocates for chemo denervation for Botox, especially for small angle isotropia. So these are some of the uh, you know, management options you could discuss if you're getting such a case of essential infantile isotropia. So you, as, this, as in this case, this child got good binocularity, sorry, good alignment uh, with uh, an early surgery. You can see she's uh, looking uh, good after surgery. So that would be one uh, case of esotropia we discussed. Let's move on to exotropia. So this is another case scenario of a three-year-old girl who has presented to us with intermittent outward deviation. And you can see that she's alternating. So sometimes squinting in the right eye and sometimes in the left eye. And uh, 
she was able to read six by 15 with layer symbols at three meters and her cyclorefraction showed a uh, simple myopic astigmatism. So how would you go about it in this case? So she's three years old and she's having intermittent outward deviation. So very common question. It can be asked both in the theory as well as practicals. How do you manage a child of IDS uh, with, in, uh, you know, a three-year-old child? So again, you have to follow a very good uh, systematic evaluation starting from history and clinical evaluation. So this is another kid, uh, you know, similar kind of child is straight mostly with glasses but occasionally uh, goes out and uh, with time the control has worsened and is manifesting intermittent divergence squint more common and more uh, frequently. So you can look at the nine gaze pictures, no particular uh, patterns, but there is uh, intermittent divergence squint. So what do you ask for and what do you really look for in these cases? First thing is, it's very important to ask them if the child has any uh, symptoms of the condition, because if it's occasionally happening and the child is not having any symptoms, you may not really want to treat. So ask the parents uh, whether how frequent the deviation is. The older children may complain of uh, asthenopic symptoms or transient diplopia. And another very common condition, uh, sorry, a very common symptom the parents uh, tell you is that uh, you know, there is something known as diplophotophobia. That is when the child goes out in sunlight, uh, immediately closes one eye. So this is because the sunlight uh, dazzles the retina and the fusion is broken and the squint is manifested. And some intelligent patients will also tell you that uh, they have micropsia, that is older children. That is, uh, you know, they are able, they're seeing everything small. So this is again, because they're using the fusional convergence uh, or accommodative convergence all the time to keep the deviation in control. Even uh, an attempt is made at distance to fuse. And so because of this, uh, everything is seen as small and close. So that is known and called as micropsia. So these are some common symptoms of intermittent divergence squint. And the next thing you would want to know is the frequency and how well is the control. So there are various scores for it, but a simple thing which I ask the parent is, how often do you see the squint? Do you see it more than 50% of the waking hours or less than 50% of the waking hours? And then if they say it is more than uh, less than 50%, I would ask them, is it less than 25% or more than 25%? So depending on that, you can grade it. And there are various scores like the Newcastle score and the modified Newcastle score. So anything above five can be taken as a bad uh, control. And if you're able to measure the deviation, uh, you will have an idea whether it's a small deviation or a large deviation and the type of intermittent divergence squint. Is it a basic type? Is it a simulated divergence excess or a true divergence excess? Or there is a convergence insufficiency type? So these are the types that you would really want to know because the management would depend on that. And if the child is having any amblyopia and how is the binocular vision? So if you're able to measure in an older child, if the binocularity is good, uh, then, you know, the management uh, also would be different. But if the child is losing binocularity, uh, then that would be definitely a red flag. And if there is any refractive error, very often the intermittent divergence squints will have some associated refractive errors, especially uh, myopia or myopic astigmatism. And uh, you may benefit from correcting these. And also look for any patterns, because presence of patterns, again, would be an indication that uh, surgical correction may be required in these children. So your discussion would hinge on these points, which I already discussed, and symptoms, intermittent divergence, squint, how do you manage it, surgical and non-surgical management, when do you decide to intervene in these kids, what is the timing of surgery, there's a lot of controversy about it, especially when you're operating on very small kids, you have to be very careful because these children are, remember, they have binocular vision potential, and most of the time they are fusers. So when you decide to operate them, make sure that you are going to maintain the binocularity because if you overcorrect these intermittent divergence squints in small children, they will immediately suppress because an ESO deviation is definitely more amblyogenic and they will go into a uh, constant squint. And the type of surgery you would do and complications you would expect. So again, management of intermittent divergence squint, uh, there are non-surgical options. So any refractive error has to be corrected, especially if it's myopia or myopic astigmatism. Even sometimes you may get hypermetropes presenting with the exotropia. It's, there is a condition known as hypoaccommodative exotropia in which you have to correct the uh, hypermetropia and the exotropia may get better. 
So otherwise, we may even use over minus lenses, especially in small kids when you want to defer the surgery, because we know that a minus lenses induce accommodation and uh, with every act of accommodation, there is accommodative convergence also happening. And this convergence keeps the divergence squint in check. But older children may not tolerate this over minus lenses. So you may have to, uh, you know, uh, you may not be able to use them in older children. And uh, there are some you know, concerns about these kids developing myopia in the long run if they're using over minus lenses. So it can use it in select cases. And in some cases you may, you can get away with orthoptic exercises like use of uh, Brock string or uh, pencil push-up exercises. And uh, yes, if they have convergence insufficiency, definitely you should, should try orthoptic exercises like pencil push-ups and all, because you can work on the convergence and you can improve on it. So this next option would be a surgical option. Uh, you have to go for a bilateral lateral rectus recession if it is freely alternating or uh, if it is uh, uniocular uh, constant squint, uh, the child is losing binocularity and has a preference for one eye than the other, then a recess resect procedure would be better. So again, these are some of the criteria which I would uh, you know, put forward when you're planning surgery for intermittent divergent squint. You have to look at the frequency and the control of the squint, the size of the deviations, symptoms, age of the patient uh, may be an important factor because uh, you don't want to really operate on very small children if it is an intermittent divergent squint with good control, duration of strabismus, distance stereo equity and failure of non-surgical therapy. So uh, we have discussed a case of ESO and we have discussed a case of EXO. So now let's move on to a little more uh, complicated ones. So is there anybody here who can uh, look up at this picture and tell me or uh, should I go about it? Uh, Ma'am, I think you can describe the cases. I'll take the questions probably from the social media portals towards yeah, the end. Yeah. So this is, uh, as you can see, this is, uh, you know, this gentleman has an abnormal head posture. He came to me with complaints of occasional diplopia and squinting since last two years. So he's a 42-year-old electrician. He's working in the Middle East. Uh, on inquiry, he's a hypertensive, hyperlipidemic, non-smoker, social drinker, but nothing else. And he hasn't sustained any trauma, uh, hasn't had any major diseases in the past, uh, or in, the, in the recent past. His visual acuity was fairly good. So when you look at us, uh, look at him, you know that there is a left face turn. So that's the first thing which strikes you as he sits in the chair and reads the Snellen's chart. So when we look at the nine gaze pictures, uh, there is a small left esotropia, if you can see, but definitely I think you can appreciate that there is an abduction limitation in the left eye uh, of, uh, you know, minus two. So he has on measurement, he has an esotropia, which is much more for distance than for near, 25 prisms for distance and only 10 prisms for near. And he has a left face turn. So all this indicates a paralytic strabismus, uh, you know, uh, there is an incompetent strabismus and the abnormal head posture is definitely to compensate for the defective abduction. And uh, any uh, adult patient or any patient who's presenting to you with an esotropia, which is much more for distance than for near, definitely warrants a complete neurological examination to rule out a six nerve palsy. So this, uh, the, this, would be, uh, this would be probably a six nerve palsy. So what do you want to ask this patient? So he has some ischemic risk factors like hypertension and hyperlipidemia, but look at the history. He has been squinting and, uh, you know, since, last two years. So actually it was his relatives who bought him and told him that he's having this, you know, abnormal head post. He's always keeping his face down to the left when we, he's talking to us. So he actually didn't complain of this diplopia. Only on asking, he was, uh, you know, he was able to tell us that he occasionally experienced diplopia. So what would you ask or what would you look for? So, so apart from the systemic risk factors, ask specifically for any history of trauma or any other precipitating uh, factors. See if the six nerve palsy is isolated or if there is any other associated cranial nerve palsy. So in this case, there was nothing. It was an isolated six nerve palsy. And uh, in a six nerve palsy, if you're getting, uh, you should also look for any neurocutaneous markers because uh, you know neurofibromas can also uh, present uh, with uh, CP angle tumors and uh, raised ICT and six nerve palsies. So that is also an important part of the examination.
So look at the family album because the patient here is, you're not very sure about the history. So I, I decided to ask him for this family album or that's called as a family album tomography. And you can see here that over the years, his squint has developed. So initially he hasn't had a squint. You can see these pictures over the years and now he definitely has a squint. So this is definitely something which has happened within the last uh, few years. So what are the investigations that you're going to do in this case? So here you have an incompetent uh, strabismus. And so you really want to know whether it's really incompetent. So what would you do? So the clinical test uh, I would really want uh, to do would be a diplopia charting, HES charting, and a full suction test, which will tell us whether uh, you know what I'm suspecting is true. So yes, the diplopia charting here uh, shows, uh, you know, uh, here, what you can see is uh, there is an uncrossed horizontal diplopia, which is uh, getting worse in the left case, which is in the field of lateral rectus. So this is uh, fitting in with the lateral rectus palsy. And uh, if you are in doubt about the paralytic element or the restrictive element, you can also do a forced action test to see if the FTT is negative or positive. So in, in this case, the FTT was negative. So uh, we did all the ancillary investigations like you know, blood tests and BP. And of course, uh, he, we went ahead and did an MRI of the brain and orbits. And it showed a schwannoma in the prepontine uh, region. So this was the uh, left six nerve schwannoma, which was slowly growing and producing the six nerve palsy. So don't be misled by the ischemic risk factors this patient has. So the history is very important. Your examination is uh, key to the diagnosis. So you have here a six nerve palsy. And uh, again, the discussion would be going on. How do you manage this? So patient has diplopia. So how do you manage? So you can have non So me, now you've diagnosed this patient has a neurological problem. Of course, you would be sending the patient to the neurologist. But meanwhile, you need to take care of his diplopia. So you can offer him non-surgical options like monocular occlusion or prism glasses. Or, uh, you know, if there is going to be some delay, you can even offer a botulinum toxin injection to the medial rectus of the same eye. So, again, uh, you have to uh, refer the patient to the neurologist and the neurosurgeon. So, probably they would do the surgery. And uh, if possible, if it's amenable to surgical uh, resection, they would excise the schwannoma. But in most cases, he would land up with a permanent six nerve palsy because these tumors are, uh, you know, they are growing from the knob. So in which case he would come back to you with a persistent esotropia, in which case you would have to resort to surgical options. So you will wait for about six months to uh, one year for some spontaneous improvement. If not, you will have to go ahead and do surgical management, which has been extensively discussed. You can uh, you know, either do a, a transposition of the, uh, of the vertical rectus or just a superior rectus transposition with and with, with or without medial rectus recession, depending on the angles that you come across at that time. Okay, so that was, uh, you know, uh, the third case, which is that of which was that of a six nerve palsy. So moving on from six nerve palsy to a little more challenging case. So this is a 52 year old housewife who came to us recently with complaints of double vision since one week. Again, she has uh, systemic risk factors of hypertension and diabetic, and then she's not very well controlled as far as the sugars are concerned. Her HbA1c is about 8.5, but otherwise her visual acuity and her uh, visual acuity is within normal limits. So what you see in this picture is that this patient, sorry. So this patient has a very prominent ptosis in the left eye with exotropia and hypotropia. So this are all suspicious features of a third nerve palsy. So definitely uh, nine gaze uh, photos confirm that she has limitation of adduction in the left eye with some amount of elevation and depression limitation. So what is the first thing that you would want to look, look for in this case? So this is an incomplete third nerve palsy in a patient with ischemic risk factors of hypertension and diabetes. But what, would you, what is the first thing that you want to look for in this case? That would be that whether the pupil is involved or not. Is there a nisocoria or not? So you have to look for the pupillary involvement. And apart from, uh, you know, rule out other cranial nerves also. So in this case, this is an isolated third nerve palsy. Especially you have to look for a fourth nerve involvement, rule out a fourth nerve involvement, see if it is complete or incomplete. And since this is an incomplete third nerve palsy with pupillary sparing, how would you manage this? That would be the question. She has ischemic risk factors. 
So definitely the blood sugars are not well controlled. So this could be an ischemic mononeuropathy for all you know, but since the, it's an incomplete third nerve palsy, it warrants a neuroimaging in the form of an MRI brain with MR angiography. Otherwise, you have to keep the patient under very close follow-up because uh, you know, we don't know whether the pupil is going to be involved or not. So keep the patient under very close follow-up if she's not doing a neuroimaging. And if there is no improvement in the third nerve palsy, you have to image. So the discussion would hinge on these uh, investigations and how are you going to manage. So if the MRI is normal and you diagnose it as an ischemic third nerve palsy, again, you would wait and watch for a spontaneous improvement uh, center to the physician for control of her diabetes. And uh, in the meanwhile, you can again offer surgical and non-surgical options, which I've already discussed, which includes <clears throat> monocular occlusion, prism glasses, and surgery would be uh, the last thing you do if it doesn't improve uh, after ruling out everything else. Surgical management has been extensively discussed and uh, I won't go into that today. So next uh, would be a very interesting case of a 28 year old painter who came to me after a road traffic accident. He had head injury with transient loss of consciousness following which he developed severe diplopia in down gaze and his visual equities were normal. And this is his characteristic head posture. So you can see here, he has a right head tilt, a chin down and a right face turn, very characteristic. So what is this condition? So this itself would be a spotter for you. So these are his nine gaze pictures. You can see here, he has a marked uh, you know, it seems as if he has a right hypo, but he's fixing with the left eye. So he actually has a left hypertropia, which is increasing in the right gaze, down gaze. And if I give you the, you know, the measurements, you would know what it is. So what's the next test that you would do? You have to say it is the box three-step test and uh, follow it up with the diplopia charting, HES charting, and uh, look for any torsional diplopia because he has a very prominent head tilt. And uh, you have to obviously go for investigations and uh, First, let's look at the PARKS three-step test. So, so these are his measurements. So he has about 25 prisms of left hypertropia, which is, as I told you, is increasing in the right gaze and down gaze and also in the left head tilt. So this is a case of left hypertropia, which is worsening on left head tilt and contralateral gaze and down gaze, very typical of a left superior oblique palsy. So he has sustained a left superior oblique palsy following, uh, this is a post-traumatic left superior oblique palsy. So how do you manage him? So uh, of course you do a diplopia charting, which confirms this. So this is their left hypertropia, which is uh, you know red uh, before the right eye and green before the left eye. So left hypertropia, the image would be down, and you can see the uh, diplopia is worse on dextro depression, which is again in the field of action of the left superior oblique muscle. So the diplopia charting supports your diagnosis. You would also want to do a double Maddox route in which you place two Maddox routes in the trial frame and uh, ask the patient to look at a point source of light and uh, ask him to appreciate any tilt of the uh, hypertropic eye. The image of the hypertropic eye would come down and ask him to see if there is any tilt of the hypertropic eye image. So the down image does show some tilt and you can ask him to rotate the Maddox in the trial frame and you can read the amount of extortion from the trial frame itself. In this case, it was about five degrees. So he has some extortion, but not too much. And uh, he has significant uh, hypertropia in primary position. So this is all fitting into a left superior oblique palsy. So the diagnosis is uh, key here. Your clinical examination is very vital in diagnosing. And uh, the management again would depend on uh, you know, the causes. So in this case, it's a trauma. So we want to wait for some time, at least for six months for some spontaneous improvement. In the meanwhile, he's very symptomatic. So you may have to resort to uh, some ways to elevate the diplopia, like you, know, you may have to give him some uh, prisms if possible, frenal prism in this case, because the, the squint is very large. And, or you may have to ask him to occlude one eye. And in the long run, he will eventually need surgical management if the uh, diplopia doesn't subside or doesn't get better or the squint doesn't get better, which was the case here. And we went ahead and did a surgery for him here. So if you look, uh, so we what we did was we 
weaken the its lateral antagonist, which was the it was the inferior oblique of the left eye and the contralateral yoke of that is the right inferior rectus. So we did an inferior oblique recession of the left eye and an inferior rectus recession of the right eye. And um, he was uh, very happy postoperatively. He did very well. His diplopia was totally gone. So this is the this was a case of superior oblique palsy we discussed. So now uh, we're going to move on to some little more complicated cases. So this is another boy who was brought by her parents with complaints of you know, abnormal head posture. So he was refusing to go to school because his friends were teasing him and he was becoming very conscious about it. So, so this is the way he looks at the Snellens chart. You see that there is a very prominent left face turn. And if you look at the nine of these pictures, what do you see? You see some esotropia here, don't you? And yes, there is some abduction limitation here. But what you see here is a little bit of narrowing of the palpebral fissure and widening of the palpebral fissure in abduction. Otherwise, he seems okay. So, so the differential diagnosis here would be because of the characteristic palpebral fissure changes and the face turn abduction syndrome here. So you can see here. So again, the management uh, would be, you know, the questions are, the, they would ask is, uh, you know, what are the causes? How would you classify Duane's retraction syndrome? What are the different types? And how would you manage these patients? So, and how would you differentiate from a six now palsy? So the characteristic palpable fissure changes would be something which you don't see in a six now palsy. And another thing is that in Duane's retraction syndrome, the amount of abduction limitation may be very great. Like it may be minus four or minus three, but the amount of squint may be so tiny. You know, it's not, it's very disproportionate. The amount of squint is disproportionate to the uh, abduction limitation or the restriction limitation, abduction restriction, uh, which is not the case in the sixth nerve palsy. So which is very often the squint is, uh, you know, uh, is comparable to the abduction limitation in a six. So these are the way, these are the questions they might ask you. And uh, you can see here, he, again, uh, we evaluated him and uh, we went ahead and did a surgery for him because he was very, uh, you know, conscious about it. And in this case, because there was no globe retraction and only palpable fissure changes and abduction limitation and face turn were the main concern, we did a superior rectus transposition to the lateral rectus along with a small medial rectus recession. And he did very well. His head posture was abolished, as you can see here. And uh, his squint also improved and his face turn uh, almost disappeared. So that was Duane's retraction syndrome. And uh, now let's move on to another case. So again, this is could be kept as a spotter for you. So this child uh, has ptosis in the left eye and the ptosis improves when he opens the mouth. So there is a Marcus ptosis. Along with that, what you see is a significant hypotropia of the left eye. And this elevation limitation is present in adduction as well as abduction. So this is a case of monocular elevation defect with Marcus ventosis. So a very complicated case, but uh, very well demonstrated in the nine gaze pictures. If you look carefully, you can pick it up very well. So these cases maybe just kept as spotters for you. So you have to identify what are the key features of this. Uh, you have to look at the both the elevation limitation in adduction as well as abduction, which would help you to distinguish from a Brown's, in which case it would be only in the adduction or in the uh, straight elevation. So you can see he uh, was able to open up his eyelid by uh, forcefully opening his eyes. And again, since he had a significant hypertropia, we bent ahead and did a transposition of horizontal rectus to the superior rectus, and uh, he did very well. And he's now awaiting ptosis correction. So again, the questions here would be, what are the, what is a possible etiology? There is, a, there is a, supposedly a supranuclear etiology to this. And uh, how do you differentiate from a Brown syndrome or a LPS superior rectus agenesis complex? So these are some questions they may ask you or uh, what are the management options? So again, uh, all the uh, investigations, uh, I mean, all the uh, routine clinical evaluation you would do for any case of, uh, any case would has to be done, any significant amblyopia has to be treated, any refractive error correction has to be given, amblyopia should be treated before you take him up for surgery, and definitely surgery is the final treatment in these cases. So next, we move on to another interesting case. You can see here, this child was brought by parents with 
complaints of uh, sudden onset of squint and abnormal head position. And you can see here, he has a significant uh, hypotropia of the left eye. And you can see here, the eye is not elevating here as well as in adduction, but elevation and abduction is fairly okay. So this is the case of Brown syndrome and uh, parents get history of some, uh, you know, trivial trauma uh, before the incident. So we watched the patient for some time, we patched him and uh, finally gave, we gave him a course of steroids, after which his, you can see that there is marked improvement in the uh, elevation in adduction. So this would be an inflammatory Brown syndrome, which has responded well to systemic steroid therapy. So again, the questions would be, what is the type of uh, disease uh, he's having? And uh, these are all congenital cranial disinnervation uh, disorders, Brown's, uh, your Duane's. So what is the etiology here? And how would you differentiate from a monocular elevation defect? And what, is, uh, what, are, the, uh, what are the typical uh, signs and uh, symptoms and uh, the type causes of it? And how would you manage them? So this is another interesting case. Uh, patient had sustained a trauma uh, four months back and was treated elsewhere and now came to us with this, uh, you know, red eye, chronic red eye. So what you see here is that he has definitely has a very prominent right eye with uh, congested, congested right eye, prominent congested right eye and a bit of ESO deviation if you look carefully. So if you look at the nine gaze pictures, you can see that Yes, uh, not only is that, yes, there is an esotropy and primary gaze. There is definitely a minus two abduction limitation of the right eye, some amount of elevation limitation, but the other ocular movements seem to be fairly okay. So uh, he also had raised IOP in that eye. So uh, what are you thinking of in this case? A case of trauma, following trauma, patient has developed uh, red eye, uh, double vision, raised IOP. So what would be a differential diagnosis? So the first thing you want to rule out is, uh, because you look at, look at him and carefully in the slit lamb, and you may be able to see dilated epistleral vessels. And in the presence of a six nerve palsy and uh, a raised IOP, you, would, you should immediately think of a CCF or keratotokian cavernous fistula. So that is what this patient had. And uh, we, uh, the first investigation you want to do is look for any, you know, pulsatile proptosis, any brewy, and uh, treat the glaucoma and uh, do a dilated fundus examination and uh, image him. Look for uh, the characteristic uh, sign would be a dilated superior ophthalmic vein, which would uh, clinch the diagnosis of CCF. And uh, definitely it can be confirmed by a digital subtraction angiography. Refer him to an interventional radiologist. And in this case, he underwent embolization of the CCF and uh, his symptoms subsided. So it's very important that uh, these cases may present to us ophthalmologist uh, and uh, the key signs should not be missed. Sometimes the condition may be very subtle, but any patient who's complaining of double vision after a trauma with a congested eye, think of CCF. And especially if the patient also has a raised IOP. So I think we have some more time. Do we have? Yeah, ma'am. We have like uh, almost 20 more minutes. Okay, so uh, shall I go ahead with yeah, uh, these yeah. discussions? Yeah. So these are again some spotters or short cases which would be kept for you. So this child has, as you can see here, uh, preterm child uh, has come to us. Uh, you know, with my parents have brought the child with complaints of squinting. You can see there was a very prominent left esotropia with some hypertropia also, and you can see. Yes, there is some inferior oblique overaction V pattern. So this is a V pattern isotropia. And uh, since there is a significant inferior oblique overaction and V pattern, you have to, uh, you know, if she has any, yes, she had a bit of myopia, so we corrected it, but the isotropia and hypertropia persisted. Treat the amblyopia if there is any, but finally surgery is required in these cases. In this case, uh, she, we had to do a medial rectus recession with uh, an inferior oblique recession, left more than right, and she did very well post-surgery. So these cases might be kept as, as for, you know, quick spotters or, you know, diagnosis based on the nine gaze pictures. So again, this is very obvious picture. You can see child having esotropia, very well controlled with classes. So this is a case of accommodative esotropia. 
So again, you can see here, uh, child having esotropia, we've given her a distance correction. She's okay for distance with the same, but see what uh, with the same distance correction, she still has a significant esotropia for near. So there is a significant uh, ESO good correction for distance. So think about a uh, high AC bar ratio in this case and giving bifocals has helped her. Her ESO deviation is much better with the uh, bifocals. So this is a case of uh, isotropia with high AC bar ratio. So this is another case. You can see this young boy has uh, been brought with complaints of uh, squinting. Again, intermittent, but classical V pattern with inferior oblique overaction, you can see here. So again, uh, you have to uh, do all the relevant investigations and correct any amblyopia and refractive error. And again, uh, this case treatment would be eventually surgery because of the significant V pattern and he's done very well with uh, lateral rectus recession and inferior oblique recession here. So this is a case of uh, exotropia, intermittent divergent squint controlled with myopic glasses. So every case doesn't have to go for surgery. You may, you know, you may be able to control the deviation with a good refractive uh, correction. So this case, uh, this girl is brought with by her parents with abnormal head posture again. You can see here she has a significant right face turn. If you look at her uh, pictures, there is a significant ESO deviation of the right eye and the characteristic palpable fissure changes are very evident here. Abduction limitation is there in the right eye, which explains the right face turn and the narrowing of the palpable fissure. Uh, this is a case of Duane's retraction syndrome, DRS uh, and ESO Duane's. So again, uh, this is a congenital cranial disinnovation disorder and uh, all the signs and you know, may be asked you may be asked to describe the signs and the types, the classification, and the etiology and uh, the you know pathophysiology of the various upshoots and uh, lobe retractions, and what can you do for this patient? So again, in this case, uh, she had she underwent surgery and good and regained good uh, alignment. In this case, we did uh, bimedial recession for her, uh, slightly asymmetrical, more in the left eye. So I think that I will stop uh, there and we can take some questions. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take that. So uh, shall I stop sharing my screen? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I think that was a very, very informative uh, lecture for all our postgraduate exam uh, tech going students, uh, because I think such good collection of cases seldom found anywhere else and I think it's readily available for them. So thank you so much for taking out your time and preparing that for our PGs. So if you have some time, we can actually have a few questions from our social media uh, portal. According to the cases, I think few questions kept coming. So I can take them now if you are okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the first one is how do we ascertain ocular dominance? Okay, so that is, uh, you know, Ocular dominance or uh, ocular dominance is a different issue. See, that is something I, I think your question probably refers to, uh, you know, which eye the child refers to fixate. Okay. So in this case, uh, in cases of squint, uh, you, you just look at uh, which eye the child uh, frequently squints. That would be one way, you know, so when as a child walks in and you, as you examine, uh, the, the patient walks and you see whether the, uh, the squint is more confined to one eye. So then the opposite eye is usually used for fixation. So, uh, and to look at the, uh, if in a very small child, uh, you can look at the uh, central study maintained fixation. Okay. So I, I, the, the question is a little tricky. Ocular dominance is a different issue. So that is like, you know, as applied for patients who have uh, you know, good vision and good binocularity, but still you may prefer one eye more than the other. So there are certain tests for that. Uh, but I would, I'm hoping that the question is actually about uh, how would you attain, how would you ascertain uh, ocular, uh, you know, any fixation preference. So which is the, uh, which is what we're discussing today. So central study may, uh, maintained fixation can be looked for. So when you cover one, the one eye, see if the child is uh, resisting occlusion uh, of the uh, uh, covered eye. So if the child is resisting occlusion of the covered eye uh, and not resisting occlusion of the other eye, that indicates that the child or the person doesn't want you to cover the good eye naturally because they are more comfortable or they have better vision in that eye. So that would be one way I showed you in the video. Uh, if it is alternating and there is no resistance to occlusion, the uh, patient is comfortable using both eyes together. 
but ocular dominance per se is a different issue. Uh, so like, you know, if suppose you're asked to uh, like, you know, close one eye and look at something, which eye would you close? So there are certain tests, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, I think you can probably uh, close one eye and put a dot and ask the uh, other person to join the uh, dot with the other eye. So, so there are certain tests, but uh, uh, that's, that's not, I think, what the person meant. Uh, the fixation preference is what uh, is pertaining to this class. Yeah. Uh, the second question is, ma'am, if the refixation movement is seen only after a blink following a cover test, what are our possible interpretations? So uh, again, I, I hope this is about an intermittent squint. So that means there is it's an intermittent squint with uh, good control. Because if it's a phoria, uh, it's an intermittent tropia in this case. So if it's a phoria, the refixation movement will happen without a blink immediately. As, you, as, so as soon as you remove the cover, it will immediately happen. And uh, there is never a manifest tropia. Whereas in an intermittent squint, uh, usually what we see is an intermittent exotropia. There is always a confusion. Is this an ITS intermittent exotropia or is this an exophoria? So when you cover the uh, eye and you remove the cover, if the patient is able to refixate immediately without even a blink, uh, you never manifest. The squint never manifests. And there is no deviation under cover also. It's a phoria. But if there is a deviation under cover and the refixation happens with a blink, it's uh, in an intermittent exotropia with good control. All right. Um, the next one is, can you please explain about cross fixation? Okay. So cross fixation is something very characteristically seen in infantile, essentially infantile isotropia. So here, you know, the child, uh, so suppose uh, when you're asked to follow a target to the left, uh, you both eyes will move like this and to, to the right like that. So in case of an infantile isotropia, the child will try to look in the opposite gaze with the eye in isotropia. So uh, to the left, the child will look with the right eye in uh, isotropic position and to the right eye, and to the right, uh, the child will look with the other eye and the abduction seems to be limited. So this is uh, what is classically known as a cross fixation. Okay, ma'am. So like you look at it, look like a cross on either side, the, the abduction movement is not happening. Only the uh, adducting eye seems to be uh, crossing over and looking to the other side. Okay. And the next one is how much time do we wait after monoocular occlusion in our OPD workup before removing the patch? And what are the precautions to be taken while removing the patch to prevent the child from fusing? So actually, they, uh, I think this question pertains to intermittent divergent squint when you have a large angle for distance and you get a very small deviation for near. So you are confused whether this is a true divergent axis or it, it's a simulated divergent axis due to a good fusional convergence. So here we have to ideally do a prolonged occlusion, but it's not always practical. So at least I do for about 30, 35 minutes of occlusion. And uh, then you, uh, the important key thing is that you should never let the child accommodate uh, bef uh, before they look at the near target. So what you do is you keep the, the eye occluded and ask your sister or assistant to hold the near vision chart and keep the prism over the uh, you know, occluded eye uh, beforehand itself and close that eye. And again, put your occluder also on top of that so that when the cover is removed, uh, one eye is occluded. And immediately when you remove the cover, you ask the patient to read the near target. So uh, uh, because of that, uh, there is no uh, you know, binocular accommodative convergence happening so that if you give the chance uh, to the child, child will fuse immediately and you may lose the uh, effect of the uh, prolonged patch. So at least I wait for about half an hour to uh, yeah, ideally, I mean, even for one hour is described, but it's not always practical in a busy OPD. So half an hour is okay, I think. All right. Um, I think uh, those were all the questions from our social portals. Uh, I again, thank you so much uh, for being here with us today, this evening. And I think our PGs have like a good 14 to 15 cases, like really ready with them with all the questions and uh, like such amazing documentation from your side. So thanks, ma'am. Thanks again. Okay, thank okay. you. My pleasure. Uh, next, I would like to announce that our next class will be on November 2nd. That is a masterclass by Dr. Uh, Jagatram sir on pediatric cataracts. 
And also, I would also like to announce for all our postgraduates that after uh, two long years of COVID era, I, I Focus physical event is back, uh, which is going to be held uh, from 26th of February to 5th of March. Uh, and the early bird registration actually ends on 31st October. So I'm very sure that you do none of you want, want to miss it. And uh, so hurry up and just register online. Uh, thanks again for being with us. And we will see you on November 2nd. Good night, everyone.